Two Visits to the Berlin Wall, a travel memoir written and narrated by Robert Fairhead from the Tall and True Writer's Website. In 2019, approaching the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, I found a timely book in a second-hand bookshop. The Berlin Wall, 13 August 1961 to 9 November 1989 by Frederick Taylor. The book inspired me to write about my two contrasting visits to Berlin as a backpacker in 1987 and 1995. Taylor tells the story of the Berlin Wall from its construction to becoming the starkest symbol of the Cold War and its eventual fall, heralding the end of a divided Germany. The book is also a history of the marsh town that became Berlin. And in his afterword, Taylor reflects on the wall, city and country post-German reunification. For anyone who knew the city when the wall cast its pall across Berlin, nothing can beat the pleasure of being able to stroll through the Brandenburg Gate and across the Pariser Platz, maybe heading for one of the boulevard cafes on Unter den Linden. And nothing is sweeter than the awareness that, compared with 20 years ago, the greatest danger you run when taking those few unhurried paces is of being knocked into by an overenthusiastic bicycle courier, not cut in half by a burst of automatic fire. After reading Taylor's book, I dug out my old travel journals and a souvenir book from Checkpoint Charlie, It Happened at the Wall, and the Ostmark note I'd smuggled out of East Berlin in 1987. However, as I have observed elsewhere, life and other writing often get in the way of my plans. The 30th anniversary of the fall of the wall on 9 November 2019 came and went, and then in 2020 we had another distraction, COVID-19. Boo! In August 2021, I heard an ABC Radio Nightlife episode of This Week in History, marking the 60th anniversary of the building of the Berlin Wall. The host interviewed BBC current affairs journalist and broadcaster Helena Merriman about the history of West and East Berlin and her new book, Tunnel 29, Love, Espionage and Betrayal, The True Story of an Extraordinary Escape Beneath the Berlin Wall. Afterwards, I bought the audiobook version of Tunnel 29, narrated by Merriman. Rather than a broad history of Berlin and the wall, Merriman focuses on Joachim Rudolf, an East German escapee who dug a tunnel with a team of university students to rescue 29 men, women and children from East Berlin. And all the while, they risk detection by the ruthless East German security apparatus, the Stasi, and infiltration by spies. Listening to Tunnel 29 spurred me to return to writing about my visits to Berlin, if not to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the wall's fall, then to mark the 60th anniversary of its construction. In 1987, my then girlfriend, now wife, and I left Australia to travel and live overseas for two years. We stayed away for nine years. The first part of our journey included two months of backpacking and u railing across Europe. When we set off, I started recording a journal of our adventures. It's a habit I've kept up ever since, with a box full of travel journals and daily diaries, the latter for the more mundane parts of my life, in a loft cupboard. The entries for this travel piece are from my 1987 and 1995 journals. Side note, I've corrected inaccuracies in my journal extracts and left out names and boring backpacker bits, typically grizzles about this or that. 23 June 1987, border campground. We made our way from the centre of Helmstedt to a campground close to the East German border, where we met five Aussie guys travelling in a Bedford van. I asked them if we could hitch a lift with them to Berlin tomorrow, and was relieved when they replied, No worries, mate. 24 June 1987, van to Berlin. Our first impressions of the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, DDR, were confusing as we struggled to follow transit lane directions at the border. The van deputised me to show the guards our wad of passports. Thankfully, the border guards were friendly, with one joking about how little I resembled my fresh-faced passport photo. Side note, I studied conversational German for a year before leaving Australia to help communicate in Germanic-speaking countries, but sign language proved more effective at border crossings than zwei beer bitter. The East German Trabants on the transit road to Berlin looked dated, and the police cars were almost comical. The Aussie guys had fixed an Australian flag on the rear doors of the van. Locals stared at us as we drove past, and one gave us a two-fingered V sign 
either peace or up yours. We weren't sure which. The fields beside the transit road seemed full of cabbages, tended to by older farmhands. There was a church steeple in a village in the distance, and yet I thought communist countries had banned religion. We had no lane directions or passport photo problems crossing from the DDR into West Berlin, and were soon in the city centre, where we said goodbye to the Aussie guys and headed for the Zoologische Garten Bahnhof. West Berlin presents as a modern commercial city, with tall buildings and a fast pace of life. As we walked around, I found it hard to believe the Berlin Wall was close by. We could have been in the streets of Sydney. We stopped for lunch outside the Berlin Zoo. Nearby were the ruins of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedankniskirche, a stark reminder of World War II among the flashy modern buildings. After lunch, we climbed the Siegersaale, Victory Column, from where we could see where West Berlin ended and the East began. Through a telescope, I recognised the backdrop of Ronald Reagan's Tear Down This Wall speech from two weeks ago, the Brandenburg Gate. We knew the wall was in front of this site, so we descended Siegersaale and headed down the broad Strasse der 17 Juni towards it. The first thing that struck me about the Berlin Wall was the graffiti covering it, and this became even more striking after we'd stepped onto the viewing platform to look into Ost-Berlin, where the wall is spotless. In the west, you can walk up and touch the wall, and graffiti it, while in the east, there's a wide, clear strip of no-man's land, between the outer and inner walls, and guards will shoot you for venturing into this area, which includes the Brandenburg Gate. The wall is lower in front of the viewing platform, but rises steeply, sheer and impenetrable on either side. It felt strange, standing in the west, staring into the east. And I wondered what the few people, mostly soldiers, we saw on the other side thought of us peering over the wall. We left the viewing platform and followed the wall to the Reichstag building, with a photographic history of modern, west, Germany on display. And then we headed for an S-Bahn station to catch a train to an outer suburban campground. Side note, other than the photographic display, I recorded nothing about the Reichstag and its historical significance in my journal. It reflects the priorities of a backpacker that my journal jumped to the routine task of finding accommodation. The campground was further from the city centre than we'd expected. We hadn't realised West Berlin was so big. And it was expensive. But then, as we've learned, that's the norm for Berlin. We cooked dinner and chatted with a Canadian couple, who had also driven across the border in a camper van today, without problems. 25 June 1987, East Berlin day trip. We rose early for the S-Bahn train to the station near Checkpoint Charlie. On the walk from the station to the border, we passed a busy construction zone with rows of new apartment blocks. Over the wall, we saw similar blocks going up in the east. Seeing parallel building works in vastly different political and economic systems seemed odd. Our passage through Checkpoint Charlie to East Berlin was smooth, although an East German border guard was intrigued by the sunflower seeds we had in our day packs for snacks. At first, I couldn't tell the difference between the two Berlins, let alone comprehend that I'd crossed into the eastern bloc. Yes, grey apartment towers flanked the streets heading towards the town centre, but I've seen similar sights in parts of Sydney, except the Ost-Berlin apartment car parks were full of Trabants instead of Aussie Holdens. In the centre, major restoration works appeared underway on grand old buildings, Near Marx Engels Platz, we stopped to photograph the impressive Berliner Dom with its tree-lined forecourt. And then we moved on to the Fernsehturm, television tower, which stands like Big Brother looking down on Ost-Berliners. At the border crossings, we'd both changed 20 Deutschmarks for 20 Ostmarks. The real exchange is closer to 10 to 1. As we had to spend all our Ostmarks before returning to the West, we visited a Markthaller, market hall, to stock up on supplies. Inside the market, we soon noticed the difference between our economic systems and the Eastern Bloc. Every shopper queued for a shopping trolley, no matter what item they wanted to purchase. The trolleys were small, almost toy-like. The shells were sparse, and the prices were much lower than in the West. The only exceptions were milk products, like our backpacker staple, cheese. We queued to buy a few items, and then went outside to the open market to queue for lunch. Eating at a table, surrounded by Ostberliners, I reflected on how communism, or socialism, seems to suit some people, and that some Australians want the state to look after them too. But at what price? 
After lunch, we looked for other ways to spend our Ostmarks. I balked at queuing to browse at a bookshop, so we visited the National Gallery. It had a fine display of anti-war paintings, but the entrance fee was minimal. We returned to the bookshop, queuing for the mandatory shopping basket, before we entered. Unfortunately, most of the books were socialist propaganda. One example was a book on modern English history, with a damning treatment of Margaret Thatcher. Side note. Having lived in Thatcher's Britain from 1987 to 1990, I wish I'd bought the book. We took a break from spending Ostmarks and walked to the Brandenburg Gate to look at it from the east. A few soldiers, perhaps Russians, were posing for photos with the graffiti-free Berlin Wall in the background. And over the top of the wall, we could see people on the viewing platform where we'd stood yesterday. It occurred to me they might be wondering if I was an Ostberliner. And to convince them one way or the other, I waved hello. We spent the last of our Ostmarks at a cafe. I had a stein of beer for 1.5 Ostmarks, recalling the 10 to 1 exchange rate, and then we had coffee and cakes. A young guy sat at a nearby table, reading a book. I felt sorry for him when we left. Assuming he's an Ostberliner, he can't leave the East. But I also felt happy and relieved we were about to head back to the West. The border crossing was straightforward, and I smuggled across a Fumpf Ostmark note, which felt like my spy who came in from the cold moment. We bought a souvenir book from the Checkpoint Charlie Museum without queuing for a shopping basket, then caught the S-Bahn back to our campground. That night we discussed the pros and cons of communism with the Canadian campers and an American couple who joined our table. And that's the benefit of our system. We can debate politics in the open, while those in communist states must toe the party line, like the Ost Berliner reading the book at the cafe. I prefer our way of life, but I know some living in Western democracies could do with the social services and security of the communist socialist states. Again, at what price? 26 June 1987, Auf Wiedersehen, Berlin. We hitched a lift with the Canadian campers from Berlin to West Germany. There was a delay at the transit road border checkpoint, packed with vehicles waiting to cross. Finally, we got through. And after two hours of driving, with only one wrong turn, signalled by a thumb back from a truck driver, we arrived at the DDR-Bundesrepublik border. In contrast to when we entered the DDR with the Aussies, the East German border guards went over the Canadian couple's van methodically, insisting they open every possible hiding place. I also saw guards checking loads on trucks and inspecting under vehicles with extension arm mirrors. I realised they were not looking for drugs or other contraband, but for stowaway escapees from the east. Like East Berlin behind the wall, the DDR was a jail. Hi, I'm Robert Fairhead from Tall and True Short Reads and the Tall and True Writers website. I shared the two visits to the Berlin Wall travel memoir on Tall and True in September 2021. Part one of this two-part podcast episode explains the inspiration for writing the piece, a second-hand copy of the 2006 book The Berlin Wall by Frederick Taylor and the 2021 book Tunnel 29, which I listened to as an audiobook narrated by the author Helena Merriman. Part 1 also includes the travel journal entries from my first visit to Berlin in 1987, when the wall divided the city and West and East Germany. Part 2 covers my second visit to the Berlin Wall and reunified Germany in 1995 and my observations on my two trips, almost three decades after my last visit to Berlin. Side note, apologies for mangling German place names in this episode. Although I studied German in my 20s, and could once proudly pronounce words and phrases in Deutsch beyond zwei Bier bitter, that was over 30 years ago. I hope you enjoyed listening to part one of Two Visits to the Berlin Wall. You can read this travel memoir and all my short stories, blog posts and other writing at tallandtrue.com. You can also buy my short story collections from the Amazon Kindle and Kobo online bookstores. Links are available in the show notes. The next episode of Tall and True Short Reads, Part 2, will be in your podcast feed shortly. In the meantime, please check your feed or the podcast website, tallandtrueshortreads.com, for earlier episodes from Seasons 1, 2 and 3. And follow or subscribe to the podcast and rate and review it via your favourite app. Doing so helps me share my storytelling.
You can support this podcast financially by making a small one-off or regular donation via the ACAST supporter page. You'll find a link in the show notes. Finally, please do this podcast a big favour. Tell your family and friends about Tall and True Short Reads and the Tall and True Writers website. Mm-hmm.